Welcome and thank you to everyone who has joined us for today's panel discussion. My name is Grace Okafor and I'm the Strategic Events Coordinator at the Institute for Ecological Civilization, a US-based international nonprofit known as ECOCIV for short. ECOCIV in partnership with the British charity Reboot the Future are incredibly excited um, to be hosting the first of several events for a new initiative titled Conversations for a Life Economy. This project builds on Reboot the Future's 2020 Imaginal Conversations, a series of private discussions that reflected on our current way of life and the reimagination of more positive and mutually beneficial relationships with ourselves, the world, and the environment. This project aims to bridge a shared understanding of core values that support a life economy with collective, corporate, or global leadership action. Today, we are excited to be having three incredible panelists whom ECOSIS President Philip Clayton will shortly introduce. And it's our hope that you will continue to follow us in this journey of reflective conversations and that the insights of these programs inspire you to actions towards a just and sustainable future. I'm gonna be handing off the floor to our president, um, Philip Clayton. So, hello. Greetings and welcome, especially welcome to Shar Gibb and Harad. Let me introduce these three people and let's dive straight into our discussion. Harad Sabiti is co-founder and CEO of the Fourth Sector Group, or 4SG, a multi-stakeholder collaborative platform dedicated to accelerating the growth of the fourth sector globally. For over 30 years, Harad has been a driving force behind numerous national and international initiatives aimed at accelerating the fourth sector's development. He co-founded the B Team and has served on advisory bodies for a number of entities, including the Aspen Institute's Intersectoral Relations Initiative, the Center for International Business Education and Research at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, and the World Economic Forum's Future Council on International Governance. Char Love is co-founder and activist in residence at B Lab UK. She co-chairs co -chairs B Lab's Global Climate Task Force. Shar is also social entrepreneur in residence at the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Said Business School, University of Oxford, where she designed and teaches an MBA elective on regenerative and circular economy. She's also contributed to their MBA core class, Capitalism in Debate. Shar is also the co-director for the newly launched Oxford Climate Emergency Program. Throughout her career, she has focused on the rise of profit and purpose businesses, regenerative and circular economic models, and how to mo mobilize a movement of movements. And when you talk to Shar after one of her uh, lectures somewhere, be sure to ask her about systempreneurship and cocktail careers. And finally, Gib Bloch is an award-winning social entrepreneur who consults, writes, and speaks about the role of business in society. After studying engineering and receiving his MBA from the University of Strathclyde, Gibb moved on to a successful business career that's included significant time with British Petrol, Mars, and over 20 years with Accenture. Gibb is the founder of the Accenture Development Partnerships, which won multiple Accenture International Awards for corporate social responsibility over a number of years. Many of you will know him through his highly acclaimed book, The Intrapreneur, Confessions of a Corporate Insurgent. Most recently, Gibb has founded the Craig Baruch Business Decelerator, positioned at the nexus of business, the arts, well-being, and the natural environment. The Decelerator is a space where people and ideas can flourish. Let me begin with one thing that all three of you share in common. Each of you has had the experience of participating in an imaginal conversation with Kim Pullman, led by her staff at Reboot the Future, together with other global leaders like yourselves. Shar, can you say just something about what were these imaginal conversations that you all participated in? Oh, well, thank you. And what a pleasure to be in this conversation today. So thank you to the team for setting this up. And uh, here I didn't give them. I miss you both. I'm excited to be in conversation with you today. Um, I really remember those sessions um, in, in how they made me feel. So just thinking back to that period of time, we were in lockdown here in the UK. I was homeschooling my kids. And there was a lot of emotion and intensity um, within our walls. And, uh, and I do remember 
just having the chance to, to be in conversation with a group of people who, who felt in flow with what was happening. And it was a warm and open, and I knew some people on the line and I didn't know many people on the line, but there was just this sense of great connection in a period of complexity. Um, so it was an important part of what allowed me to find strength and um, hope <laughs> and feel connected um, beyond the walls of our house at that very complex period. Thanks, Sarah, do you? Did you appreciate the chance during COVID to be in these intimate conversations? Um, I, I did appreciate it, uh, certainly. Uh, I'm, and, and also echoing Shar's um, greetings. Lovely to be here with everybody and, and nice to continue the spirit of those conversations, actually. Um, so yeah, what kind of stood out for me about it is it, uh, it's so much has happened, honestly, since 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 we were in those conversations that my my recollection of the sort of content of it isn't there, but I have a very strong recollection of the spirit of those discussions. And in so many of the conversations that we find ourselves in around this work, you know, sort of world saving work, um, the conversation stays at sort of a above ground level. You know, it's about structures and processes and strategies and, you know, that kind of thing. It's in the mind, uh, but not so much in the heart and in, in our higher consciousness. So I, I think something about meeting, you know, fellow travelers in that kind of a context where we didn't even talk about, you know, <laughs> what we're doing in our day jobs, uh, but more about sort of the fertile ground that's nourishing all of us and, you know, the, the foundation from which our work blossoms. So that was I thought really special. Thanks. Give you lead entire retreats at the Craig Bidoff Business Decelerator that are similar in spirit, I think, to the conversations that Kim Pullman was organizing. What what made those conversations that she does impactful in, in your opinion? Thanks, Philip. And I'm 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 loving the way you're saying Craig Biroch. It's it's fantastic. I think you've been obviously binging on Outlander or something, something like that. <laughs> Great to be here with. Hirad and uh, and and Char. Yeah, I, I remember the the conversations well. It's interesting that I'd almost forgotten Char's point around the fact that um, you know these were taking place in lockdown. It's almost you know we're starting to come out of that now. And this, of course, it's that's a great thing. But there's almost the peacefulness and the the abundance of time and some of I missed some of that stuff. And 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 Kim's stuff just came at exactly that right time. And and. Yeah, and here I'm saying, you know, striking that spirit of the conversations of being a, a safe space where people could reflect. And in fact, I, I did two of the conversations. I liked the first one, so I came back for another one. And I, I recall very vividly being in one, and it was around what they call deep time. There was different topics of the of the different conversations, and this was in deep time. And time, as you've alluded to with the decelerator, is something maybe I'll get a chance to talk more about later on. But this notion that we are so busy doing what we're doing and going so fast that the opportunity to take a breath and and there was group conversations and there was also intimate breakouts and um i find myself in this deep time conversation with a breakout with a um a chap who who all i knew was the first name was Rumi in the bottom corner of the zoom thing and, and we were talking about deep time and i started talking about what i'm trying to do in scotland and create this space where as you mentioned people and ideas can flourish and that in fact, rather than go faster and faster for to get to the, the SDGs, it might actually start by slowing down and connecting with something deeper. And and this seemed to resonate with where Rumi's head was at, and he asked for more information. And and um, he said, send it to me at the Rumi at the Rumi Foundation. So I've discovered because we didn't know who people were. Again, to your point, Sharon, most people were strangers, and this space where serendipity and synchronicity could could actually flourish was fantastic so we had a number of follow-up conversations and that's a relationship that is blossoming so of course i remember it very well and um yeah you could not have choreographed that chance encounter it was it was really beautiful that's brilliant so friends you, between you you've given ted talks including as recently as last week you've spoken at davos you've taught at oxford university you're leading proponents of a model of business and business practices that work for the benefit of people and the planet. But what people who watch you on stages may not know 
are the experiences and the core values that underlie your public persona. I'd like to help the audience get to know you as a person to, to learn what makes you tick. So may I have your permission to ask some rather more personal questions than one normally faces as a, as a business consultant? Is that okay? You're smiling, nobody's frowning sure. yet. All right. It's, it's I, don't think there's, I don't think we can say no, can we, Philip? So <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, yeah. You're in charge. Well, Haran, may I start with you? Um, a lot of people would find this, the following question a little bit difficult to answer because I want to ask you about the very earliest sense you ever had of the values that have been most basic to you throughout your life. I want, I want you to take us back to the earliest possible memories, like age four or five, about, about what seemed to matter most to you. And to make it harder, I want you to ask, talk about the evolution of that sort of just through your childhood. So you don't get to go past age 15. But how did you become aware of values, the deeper values in your life? That's, that's a hard one, but where does it take you? Um, so yeah, it, it is a hard question. And, and I've been asked that question, you know, multiple times. And every time I get asked it, I actually kind of stumble because I try to contrive an answer that's at the level that, that you know, most people seem to resonate, which is there's some causal relationship. I had some experiences in my life. My parents were really virtuous people. You know, I grew up in the cradle of civilization, whatever, like there's some, you know, external reason why, but honestly, like, um, I don't know. It's been there, you know, as, as my experience of it is like, it's almost like a, a twin, you know, that, that's inside my consciousness from, from birth. As far back as I remember, there was this broad awareness that there's something, and it's impossible to verbalize or rationalize, um, but it's been as much a guide, you know, behind the choices I make in life as my rational mind. Mm -hmm. And it's evolved, you know, it's gone from a fuzzy feeling to, all right, so this, there's also been a sense of pervasiveness with it. It has to do with, with doing good in the world, being a benefit to others, but, at, you know, at the scale of the, the challenges that I sense. So a holistic sense about it. So as that's grown up, you know, initially it was just a feeling. And then it was like, well, I want to help people. And then it was like, well, what does helping people really mean? Uh, is feeding the hungry a meal really helping them? What about the rest of the people who are hungry? What about what, why is it they're hungry at all? So that's sort of been the arc, kind of getting, just peeling back with a rational mind uh, to get to this very irrational find expression that's very irrational, non kind of material sense that, that, you know, there's something about the arc of my life that's about creating benefit for others. That's beautiful. Do you think kids are born that way? Do you think if we're not corrupted by anger or racism or hatred around us that, that humans naturally have that as like an inborn orientation? Pro-social or pro-sociality, they call it in psych. I'm as convinced of that as I am of anything. Wow. Shar, could I ask you about a, a transformative moment that you remember, say a moment in nature or something that that you think is fuels the things that you say and the quest that you're on as a learner? Yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Um, but actually, before I answer that, um, I, can I react just- Of course. But <laughs> here on the side, because here at I, um, I really hear what you're saying around that arc. And I actually would just sort of say, you also have this ability of um, connecting and, 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 and bringing other people on that journey with you. And I actually really do remember exquisitely um, having orange juice together in that shipping container hotel. And I think it was at the night after a big Unilever event where we had connected on some of the themes that maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit later. But I remember, I remember the feeling of being in conversation with you. And so hearing and feeling your story and how you challenged me in the most graceful and joyful way ever. So I, I just wanted to build on, on a, a transformative experience. For me, it was, you know, having some orange juice in a shipping container hotel <laughs> with your ad. And I think there, it shows that there is a range of just golden threads um, that connect our own personal journeys, but also connect us to each other and, and give. I actually think it was 
at another Unilever event where you and I had, you, you had provided this incredible equation um, when doing report backs from a series of tables. And you had said that when it comes to collaboration, one plus one can equal 11. And, and that like just totally stuck with me. So um, both. I, I at, stole that. I stole that from Kim's uh, Kim's husband, Paul. He's the first guy I heard saying one plus one equals 11. So I don't think that's original, but, oh, but I'll claim well, there, we else does. <laughs> there we go. But it just, it does just so. And I know Kim, you know, Kim's work so much on the golden rule. And, and, and here we have actually a series of golden threads that are connecting us. And so I, you know, I know in terms of a transformative experience, absolutely. I have had extraordinary moments for example, in nature, I'm a, a swimmer, and I remember um, being on a very long sea swim um, when the IPC report came out, not this most recent one, number six, but the, the previous one. And I remember that feeling of being in the water and being so in awe of the ocean and all its power and its beauty, and then reading the crisis situation around climate, that that was just a real um, jarring of two worlds that was transformative for me. Um, so, so that is the nature story that I'd like to bring, but I would just sort of signal that, you know, those transformative experiences can happen in every minute of every day if you're open to them and you find yourself open to the sorts of people <laughs> in this world um, that, that can be a part of that, that golden, um, golden understanding and finding ways to engage in the things that we are put on this planet to engage in. That's beautifully put. It also sounds like a direct invitation to give to talk about the decelerator. Having watched the publicity film, it sounds like so much what you're trying to do on an island off the west coast of Scotland. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be delighted to talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just reflecting on this notion of nature versus nurture that that, um, that what makes you who you who you are. What Hirad was sort of alluding to, and yeah, I agree, Charles. You know there are these moments all the time, but I think for me personally, certainly looking back and I didn't know it at the time, but when I look back, it's very clear that growing up on a, a small Scottish Island, sea all around. Yeah. So I had all the, the, the nice ocean sea, um, but also community and a real sense of community and fairness, if you will, and helping one another. I, I grew up to, um, um, pair of teachers as, as, as parents and you know I just remember in these evenings in Scotland um, a lot they'd be out know, shaking a tin round the round the doors for this charity or that charity and even now I go back to to visit my mum who's still there and the the dining area has the dining room has been annexed as the sort of counting little coins of whatever has been gathered from what, what you know she's still doing it at 81 um, so certainly I think these things are quite, they leave an indelible mark uh, on you. And that certainly shaped the career of what I went into, what you alluded to in the introduction, which was much more around international development. I, I was the first in my family to go into business, really, from a family of teachers. And, but it was always, it always jarred with me, this notion that it's all about dog eat dog, winner takes all, shareholder value maximization. There must be more that business could do. Um, and and so trying to turn business from being, you know, to be a force for good in some ways. And I know here I going to be talking about what what he does in that that kind of area. And I'm agnostic about whether that's business, private sector or public or you know for profit, non profit. How can we create the structures um, to do that? Um, but I'll, I'll pause there. I'll happily come back and talk about um, yeah more about what I'm doing. But I'm keen to. I don't want to hog the floor and talk de deceleration because that's sort of. That came afterwards, but I, I am selling a little bit this idyllic Scottish island. That's that's part of the story. Yeah, well, we definitely will get there. I want to ask a question that we often don't get to before we turn to business applications. And that's mm. the question about, I mean, just to put it bluntly, what are the deepest values that drive your work? Let's do this one a little bit differently. Let me just ask Char to mention a couple of the ones, and then I'm going to be silent and and Haran and Gib, just jump in, augment, challenge, um, offer others. Let's just see where you guys take it. I think that would be fascinating. Do you mind just starting, Shara, with whatever comes to mind when I say, what I'm are gonna the- going to challenge, challenge Shara on our values, you know? <laughs> 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 You're the wrong values, Shara. 
I, I was going to say, oh dear. Um, well, let me let me share with you a few words, maybe, if I may, of of I guess, um, yeah, values, values. Um, there was a line lines of poetry that have actually been handed down through the generation in our families. So it's sort of carved in wood over a fireplace and then taken to another home and in the next generation. And actually, uh, I, it was a gift that I gave to my siblings a couple of years ago for Christmas, for our own versions of the wood carving. And the lines of poetry, uh, they go something like this. Two things stand like stone, kindness in another's trouble and courage in your own. And increasingly, I kind of want to drop the why and make it not your own, but our own, because we all share. We, we all share the, the, the need for courage. Um, but, but where I bring that to here is that I think this idea of kindness and courage are, are really important. Um, and I think they actually self-reinforce one another. So if we are in times where we feel we need courage, I think showing kindness and feeling kindness actually can open up new levels of courage. And equally, you know, courage should lead to more and more kindness. So those are two sort of principles, again, that have been handed down and just so happen to be a part of a, a few lines of poetry. Um, the other more, more recent, um, I won't say it's not values, it's more of a framing of values. And here, you and I've talked about this before, and you know, sunflowers. <laughs> um, and I actually recently learned this word from botany, which is heliotropy. And it, it literally translated from Greek is helio, which is sun, and tropy, which is to turn towards. And it's from botany, and it refers to the tendency of plants to grow in the direction of the sun. And I think we as humans are actually not that different. We will grow taller and stronger and faster when we are motivated by warmth and light and positivity. But <laughs> there's a big but here. Like sunflowers don't, you know, float off into the clouds. Um, sunflowers are radical and radical in the origin of that word, which is rooted. Um, and so I think that's really important that we need to be rooted to each other and our communities. We need to be rooted to the science and what it's telling us and really grounded in, in the realities of the world we're living in right now. So um, kindness and courage as values and this ability to live in a space where we can be both hopeful and moved by a positive vision and a positive future that we know we all have the power to help be a part of creating whilst also staying grounded and rooted just like those sunflowers i love that term how do you how do you say it again heliotropy heliotropy and then sometimes uh, i don't have a very uh, my, my british accent sometimes gets a little muffled not my non-british accent i should say but it's so it's not it's h-e-l-i-o so helio and mm. then Tro trophy, not trophy, uh, which is what I get sometimes. You know, people like mm. trophy, T R O P Y, helio trophy. Yeah, just remember, I got, I got a sunflower on my desk to always remember. And literally, as the sun, you know, and you've seen it, as as the sun crosses the sky, literally the sunflowers follow it over the course of the day. So we just need to be more like sunflowers, move in the direction of the sun, but stay deeply rooted to each other and how we do that. I'm actually also going to pick up on, on what you termed on the, the courage thing, actually, because I was, you know, when I was thinking about values, I was obviously going back to this community thing of community and, and, and um, the notion of fairness and, and, and these traditional values. But I, I like the courage one as well. And I think that's certainly something that has um, come to the fore, I suppose, in, in a lot of what I'm, I'm doing in business. I'm very interested in this notion, as, as you know, Shar, about how do we create the social entrepreneurs inside large organizations? There's lots of social entrepreneurs that you have to leave your job and you go out and you do something good and it tends to be quite small and, and, and look nice, but it's on a small scale. And how can we awaken such people inside organizations? And, and, and that means probably stepping away from the herd and going where the, the scary places where people say you shouldn't go, where your career's probably been going to be at risk, where you're going to be ridiculed, and 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 certainly <laughs> plenty of my fair share of that. Trying to create a non-profit in a for-profit, but I, I like that. I, I the courage thing, I think, is something that I think is increasingly going to be important for people to stand up for what they believe in, irrespective. There's plenty of people are going to follow the herd towards whatever that is follow the sun this you know the sunflower the sun has been shareholder value maximization in business and that mantra and there's no shortage of people galloping stampeding towards that 
but it's more difficult, I think, to step away, and it's going to need people to step away. I don't know what you think, Hirad, but uh, I know you're you've stepped away from the norm, and people probably give you some funny looks talking about fourth sector and and things. But um, I love it. Um, yeah, we get funny looks from time to time. Uh, it's interesting. I, I remember when when Shar you told me about the heliotropy um, idea and principle, I, you know, I still also vividly remember our conversation. Um, and that I have carried that concept with me, um, you know, very, very close ever since. Um, and it, it's, I, I think in many ways, actually sort of fundamental to, um, to, to the way I, I've been seeing the world and, and the work, um, you know, what's resonating about the work that we do. Uh, but I, I think yeah, the the light isn't the isn't Wall Street. Um, I think the light is are the social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs you're talking about, and the impact investors and the the people whose consciousness has been awakened enough in whatever discipline and position they're in, um, you know, who are seeing a new way of doing things. I think that's the light. So if well, we just it, all it turn is. there. But I'm talking the north. So much I mean, less scary. I'm talking the north star. I mean, the north star though has been um, shareholder primacy, is what I'm saying. Absolutely, I'm not saying Wall Street is a source of great, uh, great shining light. Um, apologies right. to those. Right. Whether it's the north star or a mirage, I'm not. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, that that we might agree on for sure. That we might agree on. Well, it's certainly not enough, right? I don't. I don't have a problem with yeah. people making money and having return and sustainable, scalable businesses. And my God, you know, it's just reflecting the other day. And since I started my career, there's businesses that didn't exist when I started. And here you've been going 30 years as well. Here, I, I was surprised that you, know, you look so young. But, you know, some of the trillion dollar G20 size businesses didn't, weren't started. You know, show me the social enterprise that has scaled at the same, you know, I wish there were social enterprises. So to my mind, you know, if we're going to try and get to scale, we need to start with scale and get these enormous super tankers moving slightly in different directions. And that's going to mean awakening, I think, at the cellular level, imaginal cells, if you will, within organizations. I think there's so many people in these organizations who are co-opted, I think, into whatever that mantra is, who are just ripe for being, you know, awoken to, to something different. They're crying out for purpose, crying out for meaning. I, I, and I would contest, and I'd be interested in your views on this, that, that the, 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 the lockdown and the, the pandemic actually gave people this temporary notion and temporary opportunity to step off the hamster wheel for a period of time, to be at home, to have more time to reflect, to not be jumping onto planes. I mean, people are, are so you know busy doing stuff they've now had a chance to actually lift their heads for a little bit and say, what is it I'm doing? Is it valuable? And not all want to go back in and jump straight back onto that hamster wheel again. I, I hope they don't. I don't know what you what your experience is. Is that something you, you, you speak to people about? Certainly. And, you know, one thing I think, um, just to take it back a half step to values as well. One thing I've noticed is that that deceleration, the, the, the sort of forced deceleration um, has, you know, be, we're so used to, you know, for me, one central value, had I had children, I would like make sure they, they, they learn this from, from the get go, is to think with your heart as well as your mind. There, you know, we have as developed, as, you know, like what is the most important thing to just about everybody, love. Can you possibly understand love with your intellectual, rational mind? There's just no way to understand it, but you absolutely understand it with your feeling mind, right? Your heart. You understand it, but not in a verbal, rational, logical way. So I, one of the things that I think has really fortunately started to balance a little bit, like we so over-indexed on our thinking mind. We have to understand the world and understand our purpose and understand why climate change is happening or why, whatever, like this, this thinking thing 
Whereas most of the things that bring us quality of life are in the feeling realm, okay. our heart senses them much more than our rational mind. So yeah, one I, of the things I've noticed, yeah, COVID has opened up the opportunity for people to sort of awaken their this other side of their consciousness. I saw you smiling. Oh, I love conversations like this. It's so great. Um, it, it actually was reminding me, um, I, I have to admit, I don't, the, 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 the periods of sort of the intense time here in the UK pandemic, I, I struggled because I, I wasn't feeling slow, like deceleration or slow down because I, I have two young kids at school. So all of a sudden it was all the work and homeschooling. Um, and so it was extraordinary. And you know, I, I was, wasn't sleeping very much because everything needed to be fit in, but, but coming, coming to this conversation we're having, you know, in particular, this idea of how do we, how do we teach our kids and what, what do we engage with them? I mean, I, I got to know my kids so much more deeply because I was homeschooling them and we got to do things that were so cool together. Like I remember on a particularly frustrating week where I, I wasn't on top of, you know, grade six or year six home, like math homework. Um, we just started watching some of the Oxford Union debates, one of them in particular, <laughs> they're on YouTube, you know, and I've got an eight year old and 11 year old and we watched this one which was like, is it moral for there to be billionaires and like these are complex themes but it was just like I, it was just so interesting to have conversations with them and 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 to hear what they it's what they thought here to your point but it's actually what they felt about things and just opening up very different kinds of conversations than perhaps would be the kinds of conversations they'd necessarily have at school. So anyways, I, I, I love this conversation and I love that it, 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 this is, it feels really very much like a direction I think we're, we're going in, which is, you know, recognizing there is room for, you know, the sort of more rational skills and, and analytic, analytic abilities. I don't think it's one or the other, it's creating space for, for both and, and, the head, um, the heart, the other thing I would say is like the hands. And I, I'm, a, I'm a kinesthetic learner, you know, like I learn by doing. So it's, it's almost how we, how we unite those three forces so that we are thinking widely, we are feeling and loving widely, and we are finding ways to use our hands to do things because this is a moment that really matters. And- You were we gonna say, to um, I thought you were gonna say the, uh, sorry to interrupt there, the, um the head, the heart, and the the gut actually, because I mean, I was I'm interested in what you said about the heart. That, that I've discovered that there's there's as many neurons in your gut and in your heart as there are in your head, and they talk about heart intelligence, body intelligence. You know, some you know, the body can know things bef certainly before your head, and and it's 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 fascinating. And I, I don't I don't know, but the the hand intelligence. Although I did listen to a fascinating podcast recently about. Um, I don't know what the plural of octopuses are, octopi, octopus. Anyway, how they, you know, and to your to your child's mind thing, the, evidently the the mind of a child is much more this kind of explore, you know, um, and exploit kind of thing versus, um, you know, the adult's brain, which is you know you've got all your data and then you're trying to sort of make the most of it, make money or do stuff or whatever, and we shut out all this stuff. And evidently the octopus has a kid's brain more or less in the end of each of its eight legs going out, touching, feeling with its skin and, and bringing back all this kind of information of what's that? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it hot? Is it? And then it goes into the central brain, which synthesizes it. And there is something again, back to my kind of bias around business that we are so programmed into this brain that is, you know, we know it all, we've done all the kids stuff we've played we've you know, we know how the world works and it is, here are the, the, you know, the received wisdom as how business is going to operate. And if we could just go back to that, That's, maybe by homeschooling your kids, go back to thinking in that childlike mind, thinking with your body rather than just your head, then we're probably going to go in different directions, right? So, Gib, that's a great transition to really the major po point we want to focus on in, in the final minutes. This is the point where speakers give, these are the three central principles. And all of us, when we design talks, we build them around our central principles. Let's reverse that like the octopus now. And let's just take one arm of the octopus. Well, if she's a, whatever, a, the octopus with three arms would be <laughs> beyond my Latin abilities. Um, instead of starting with the general principles, could each of you start 
by telling us a specific solution that you're advocating for or that you're directly involved in implementing. A very, as highly specific solution as you can possibly name. And let's just do a free flow discussion since you guys are friends and really good at this. People may say, oh, I like that. It's similar to what I do or, oh, my work really contrasts with that. Let's just completely see where this conversation leads. But I wanna start with specificity and not general principles. What, what would be a specific solution that you advocate for or you're directly involved in implementing? I'm, I'm happy to chime in first and others can, can, can go after. I mean, I, you, you've alluded to the, the decelerator. The decelerator I'm trying to create predated the, the lockdown. It's funny that we're talking about having slowed down and being forced to slow down. I suppose I was trying to create that kind of space and still am post pandemic to, to, to not just take people. It's not a case of slowing down and stopping. It's, it's a case of trying to bring business people together with other business people from other, you know, industries, from people from other sectors, and then connect them to this sort of right brain stimuli of, of nature and, and art and music and community and create the kind of spaces that um, we can have innovation flourishing. My belief is that we, when we think about innovation, we think, oh, it's another app or another, you know, device of some kind. And I think innovation is moving much more towards how do we, how do we tap into human ingenuity to tackle social and environmental problems. I think COVID, we've seen an explosion of entrepreneurship over, you know, in, in 2020, there was more businesses started than in 2019, you know, so there has been an explosion of entrepreneurship and this notion of intrapreneurship. Um, that's the dress rehearsal for the big challenges of the sustainable development goals of, of net zero and things like that. And I think if, how do we create the conditions through, I'm calling it a business deceleration process. How do we create the conditions um, where we can actually open people up to these different forms of intelligence. Um, so that's my concrete thing that I'm working on and, and it's online as well as on this island as well. But what do others think? I'm happy to jump in on that one. Although I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm excited to hear what, um, hear Ad's gonna add into this, this conversation too. So I, I totally agree with you, Gib. There is something, quite extraordinary happening. And I think it comes back to this courage piece, like where we have find the courage to unlock new places where that ingenuity lies, you know, and those new sources of inspiration. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I really believe in this. And, and I also think it's about, you know, you say it's the coming together. Um, and so I think, you know, where, where, what I'm really excited to see is where and how we create the platforms where people who genuinely and meaningfully have different pieces of the puzzle can find the ways to kind of connect them and, and recognize that they can do so much more. One plus one equals 11. They can do so much more uh, when they're together. So I, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated about the ways and way we bring people to come together and then how the organizations or movements um, that people are a part of can then join forces. And, um, you know, here and I've talked about movement and movements as a sort of systems change um, platform, but like where and how we create the conditions where people can come together. So that, that is one intervention. At some point, I would love to come back because the other one really very much aligns with, you know, your leadership in this space, Gib, which is, you know, entrepreneurship. And uh, and I think one of the, the frames around entrepreneurship that I'm interested in is, is where we can see activists surfacing within business. And I'm, I'm wearing my like nice suit today, of course, because we've got a great audience, but on the back of my suit, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got butterfly wings that have come from being on protests and actually having butterfly wings stamped on my suit jacket. And it's just as a reminder that as we are in business, we must also be finding ways to activate and finding the courage to do the things we know that are needed rather than being limited by what feels possible, because actually we know what's needed. The science is telling us what we need to do. So yeah, anyways, that's, there's two, movement of movements and how we come together and go further and faster together and how we unlock our inner activist and get uncomfortable and be courageous to do what's needed. I'd love to come back on that point. I know Hirad's gonna come in first, but I'd love to come back on the activism as well. That's a, that's a, you go, you go Hirad. And, and I'd also love to hear 
specific activists or specific actions that, that give content to that term. I'm drawn by it, but I want to know what it means, what it has meant to practice fraud. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pick it up there. Um, so I, I agree with everything that, that Shar and Gibb has said completely. Um, and the way, so, you know, I, I keep trying to do this mind experiment, like where I land from another planet and observe, you know, the earth and, and human activity over a lens of like a few thousand years and just sort of see what the patterns are. Um, and so the movement of movements to me is the same thing as heliotropy um, and is what's underway already. There is a movement of movements emergent. Um, if you scale back and look at what's happening and uh, you know, um, Paul Hawken talked about this some years ago with his blessed unrest work. There is a movement, you know, so many people have been awakened, um, you know, and are starting to, are, are looking for, we're all looking for the light. And more and more people are finding it. And the more they find it, they will help in, illuminate others, basically. So they'll generate more light because we are connected in this golden thread that Shard talked about. So to me, um, the there's, you cannot do better than nature um, at problem solving and innovation, um, you know, and, and sustainable growth and so on. Um, and human beings are very much an extension of nature. It's, it, you know, you just have to squint your mind a tiny bit to realize that everything that makes you up came from all the plants and animals that you consume since birth. And all those plants and animals were nourished by other plants and animals. And this goes, you know, and you go back far enough in time by all of our ancestors whose molecules basically, you know, became soil and nourished those plants and animals. So in a yeah, very we've become, tangible... We've become so disconnected. We've become so disconnected from that. I agree with you, but surely in this modern, people don't know where their food comes from. It just arrives in the supermarket shelves sometimes. You know, and, and, and that's the problem. We need to reconnect people to what they already know in their, in their genes. Um, people have forgotten that. They've, it, we've had a culture of individualism in the last Agreed. Those years. Agreed. So, do we, so, so is the task to wake up the people who've forgotten uh, while ignoring the ones who are already awakened or, or remembering? Or is the task to find, you know, figure out what impedes the ones who are trying to do things a different way of which, as you said, there are tens of millions of entrepreneurs starting new models of enterprise every year that, that come at it with a different sense of purpose and logic. But all those entrepreneurs and enterprises grow up in an ecosystem that dates back centuries, the ecosystem for enterprise dates back centuries where slavery was the norm, top-down hierarchical governance you know, is the way you did things and nature and human were resources for ex ex extraction, basically, for profit making. That's the ecosystem we have for business and tens of millions of new shoots are being born each year or entrepreneurs within institutions that are locked by the ecosystems that, that they find themselves in. So to me, to make it more concrete is, is recognize, see the emergent patterns that are all across the economy, all over the world and have been basically growing and growing uh, for decades. Recognize them as a distinct sector of activity and intentionally create the supportive environment around them in the same way that we grow the private sector as the top goal for economic progress and development. We measure progress as more and bigger for-profit firms. The private sector grows, everything works. Recognize there's a whole nother sector class movement of entrepreneurs and investors and consumers and so on. Recognize that's a whole new sector of trying to be born and do the same kind of thing you do to grow this sector for that. Just widen the aperture. Completely, I, 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 absolutely. You know, I'm a, I'm an advocate of the fourth sector and written about it a lot, so I, I get that. I do want to pick up the one. You know, while we can see there's a future that will have a thousand new flowers blooming, creating this new sector, I do want to pick up on Char's point around this. You know, entrepreneurship and employee activism. Entrepreneurship, I see, is a little bit different. They're close bedfellows, so we do need to awaken you know, people having new products, services, whatever, business models inside business. Activism is a, almost a more simple and almost powerful thing that 
that you don't have to have everyone on board. You can see what, you know, 100 people signing a letter in Microsoft can do to change policy around stuff. You can see what Google strikes do. You can see it's happening in Silicon Valley, but it's spreading on out. And, you know, so it's a few people getting together and employees starting to, I think, wield their muscles in, in business. You've got this kind of business is so directed by the handful of usually white men at the top um, dancing to the tune of that Wall Street that we talked about before. Whereas almost we're seeing a democratization, I think, going to start taking place across companies where power is shifting downwards and outwards. And we're starting to see that individuals find that they have a voice, maybe not collect individually, but collectively they do have. And if these companies know that the human capital they need to deliver on their services is willing to walk out the door or willing to act in, uni you know, in unison with one another, then that's a really powerful force. So I think we're, see we're seeing the surface just being scraped at the moment. You're seeing Alphabet Workers Union. What's that all about? You know, the median salary in Google is like 400 grand a year or something. It's not for better terms and conditions. It's about purpose and values that is the next battleground, I think. And employees are going to start shaping business strategy Beautiful. bottom up. Beautiful. Shar, where does that take you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I, I, I like your framing there, Gabe, because I think you're right. Entrepreneurship and business activism, they're, they're connected. They're not exactly the same thing. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm not sure which is, which is part of which, but they, they are connected. Um, we, you know, it's interesting because I've been looking at sort of practices that businesses are and people within business are engaging in as part of a, a business activism um, framing. Uh, and this is partly tied to my, my new role at B-Lab UK as an activist in residence, which is like, we're all trying to figure out what that means. Nobody really knows, but hey, like we're going to figure it out together. Um, but in part of that, you've been tracking is sort of stories of some organizations that what they're doing to be an activist business is actually they're finding ways for their people to join outside movements. So, you know, you've talked Gib, about the internal movements of, you know, sending statements, new power within an organization. And I think there is something here about where and how businesses support their employees to engage outside of the business in social movements and protests. Um, a great example is uh, Ecosia, the search engine. They actually pay the legal fees for their employees that are arrested due to nonviolent civil disobedience. Kind of interesting, right? Or another one is Finisterre, which is a UK um, uh, clothing brand. And what they hosted was an ocean activist training camp for people that were connected in with their organization. They did that as part of their C7 campaign that happened at the same time as the G7 here in the UK. So there is something there about how you support your, your people to engage in these movements, get on the streets, finding things that they feel strongly about um, advocating for. And this ties, this is really important for systems change because um, Erica Chenworth's research shows if you get three and a half percent of the population engaged in, 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 in protest, you know, that, that's how you ensure a serious level change in, in a society. And so, this uh, this idea of how we get people engaged is, is quite critical, but it's not just about getting people on the streets. And sorry, I'll just finish this up because I think, you know, this is sort of a series of um, stories we are collecting and putting into a bit of a, I don't want to say framework because I make it sound like too frameworky, but, um, but we're trying to understand some common themes here. Um, there's also companies uh, like Patagonia that are taking a stand on issues they really care about. So Patagonia recently pulled its products from a high-end Jackson Hole resort when they caught wind that that resort had hosted a right-wing conference. Like, so there's, like, that's a form of taking a stand uh, in, in a really important way. Um, Patagonia also funds uh, and supports bold direct action organizations that are focused on the root cause of the environmental crisis. So that's another way in which we're seeing businesses and people in businesses activate. And then the other one that I is, you know, we've already spoken about it already, but I will bring it up again is engaging in collaborations with others in your industry that are, you know, that are, are industry associations looking at really ambitious levels of change, again, being guided by what is needed rather than what feels possible and changing the rules of the game, you know, where and how do we need to fundamentally see different policies in place. So our systems and markets work differently. The one thread that seems to be tying all these different forms of stories of business activism is that what's critical is that the business is a tool for the activism, 
rather than the activism being as a tool for the business. And that might be a place where there's sort of some interesting deeper conversation. Here's a question. I want to jump in and then I want to, in our last minute, step back a little bit toward that bigger vision that is so clear when I see you guys on stages, namely whether it's movement of movements or if it's successful, how will it, what will be the snowball effect look like? I really don't want to end without hearing something about that, but give us a respond directly to Shara. I, I just wanted to ask a, 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 probably a little bit of a challenge on what you're saying with Shara. I don't, I don't disagree, but if we're having to make choices, right, between, and don't, let's take Patagonia out of it because I'd say their employees are already on a ship that, you know, <laughs> they're the believers, but let's say a, a more controversial um, company, let's say a Nestle, right? Um, that touches 1.5 billion people around the planet every day, right? Huge. You know, do I want an, uh, somebody in new product development or a brand manager or something to be going out on the streets, you know, or coming up with, you know, a lower plastic or biodegradable or more nutritious or whatever issue you want to have? I mean, I mean you might say the answer is, and both have nothing wrong with people going out in the streets, right? But I can go out, you can go out, the person next door can go out on the streets. But there's something about somebody in a Google or a Nestle or an Accenture doing something on the inside that for me is really powerful. And we, you know, we need to be cognizant of that. Yes. And that power is all the more important for it to be, I think, focusing on some of the movements of change. So I would answer exactly as you said, Gib. it's not one or the other. I think it, it actually is fundamentally about both and. And the changes and the challenges that we are facing collectively as society right now are going to require us to operate on many different planes in order to address them. So fundamentally both and. And I would say all the more reason for people within these big multinationals who have a very profound view on what is needed to, yes, do that within their organization, but lend their support as well to the organizations that are really trying to push things to go further and faster. I'm really interested in understanding what the vision for success, for genuine transformation in markets and in how humans trade and, and live together looks like for each of you. Um, it's the scaling question, really. So, Shar, you said it earlier when you said movements of movements. Can you just flush that out a little bit and let's see where it takes Harad and, and Gib? That, because that's a scaling notion, right? We, You guys have identified six or seven examples of movements and activities, but what does movements of movements add to that? There's something you have in mind, I think. Well, actually, if it's okay, I'm going to pass that to Hirad because I think he's been giving a lot of thought to how we build collaborative spaces um, for the systems level change. So. That's okay. I, I guess I'm really interested in hearing Hira's view on this. Oh, thanks, Char. Um, I'm trying to find the, I'm just listening to you guys talking and all these pictures are running through my mind. So, but they're not the same image. So I'll, I'll get to your answer, Phil, but I need to kind of go around this, this, little, um, this little logic chain. So it feels like what we're saying is the movement of movements towards what? What are we moving towards? Act, you know, act, and then we talk about activism. Activism towards what? Now we're talking about social entrepreneurs as well as entrepreneurs to push the organization towards what? Right? So, and, and it, it, all of those, feel, so if you look back in time, just decade after decade after decade, what you see is the number of activists and movements, act, you know, people engaged in movements, and companies moving in the right path and investors moving in the right path has done nothing but increase. So the movement we're trying to accelerate has been increasing for a long time. And yet we're backsliding on climate, on biodiversity loss, on all kinds of critical issues. So the movement keeps growing and we're saying, let's put even more hands and more energy into growing this activism from outside, inside, or, you know, movements, et cetera. So, so I feel like we're just holding this gigantic boulder over our shoulders and trying to climb up a very steep hill. You know, and we want more and more people to get together and push on this. We need more movements engaged on pushing this boulder and more activists and so on. But the boulder is so ridiculously heavy, it will never get up that hill, in my opinion. You cannot bring a legacy architecture dating back centuries. It's like trying to get a horse and buggy, go from a horse and buggy to a Tesla in one leap. It just can't happen. It's not designed. And so 
And then the other side of it is, and this is where the metaphor falls apart, somewhere on top, like in this, like it's the top of the hill, whatever, there's this really beautiful vista where the, there's a bunch of settlers who've managed to sort of climb their way up there. But there's like just no infrastructure to support them. It's very difficult to be there. It's very difficult to get there unless you're, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't connect the, the, the pictures, but my point is, even if these activists and movement of movements succeeded, it, there is, it's, it's impossible to be at the destination we're trying to go to because the infrastructure isn't there to support it. We're trying to habitate somewhere that cannot currently be supported. Unless we figure, we focus our minds directly on enabling that, new, that space at scale, we do economic development. We have to widen the aperture and say, it is no longer sufficient to only develop the profit maximizing, financially centric mode of economic activity. Also grow the benefit optimizing mode of activity, right? Also, that's it. I, and I, then I, these movements have a place to move to. But, but here, is there some, uh, I'm gonna pick up your analogy of the boulder going up the hill and I'm thinking of more a snowball going down the hill, right? <laughs> gathering momentum and gathering, you know, size. Um, I was how, playing with that, but. How we, yeah. how we get there, well, but but I mean, I, I think there's some switch that needs to go on in the minds of certainly today today's leaders. Longer term, I'm sure there's going to be fourth sector, whatever. But if we, you know, the what, and then servers of what, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, Net Zero, we've got a reasonable barometer of where we need to go to. The problem is, at the moment, we have this vicious circle of people, you know, trying to maximize short-term profit, trying to um, do a bit of CSR on the side or sustainability to give them the license to operate, burning out people, people making more and more money, working harder and harder, more and more unhappy. Something has to switch there where by if we reframe these challenges as the business opportunities, you know, estimated, as you know, around about $12 trillion or something in terms of how we feed, nourish, the next billion on the planet and they're coming and clean energy and provide them with water and sanitation and all these things. That's the SDGs. That is going to be an amazing opportunity for business to tap into that, that value. And it's going to mean new business models, new hybrid models. Um, and the idea is, I think, again, back to this, you know, it's going to come from that body intelligence and heart intelligence of the people working in these institutions. And if we flip that and have people working in organizations whose North Star is purpose and who are going out there and doing some of this good in the world, I know this might sound some, you know, slightly nirvana and simplistic, but I do think there is something around the fact that we will have more engaged, more inspired, less burnt out people working for organizations who truly embrace and embed purpose rather than having it as a, a marketing derived um, mission that's state. A, that's a brilliant brilliant closing statement char it turns out you get the last word one minute how would you tie this together from what you just heard from harad and give well i would actually i, I sort of agree <laughs> i agree with all of this um the only thing i would add so it's not to try and tie it together because i think both of these reflections sir stand so strongly on their own I, I i'm not sure i can do justice to trying to summarize them and bring them together um, I think the thing that that I'm left with just thinking about is who makes the decisions on this. And um, I, I'm following the work quite closely around citizens assemblies and making sure that we have ways of, make, of, of listening to people whose voice might not always be in these conversations for a range of reasons. And, and if we are truly going to move to a place where we are, as you said here, having a wide aperture, and, you know, Gib, as you said, like harnessing the collective ingenuity of people, then we, we just need to be very, very explicit in making sure we are, we are going out as widely as possible. And I certainly am finding the work I'm learning about um, citizens assemblies and how we, how we reach out and listen to citizens being critically important for where this all goes next. You guys were absolutely brilliant. This was one of the most comfortable uh, conversations with tensions, but also deep areas of agreement with concrete details and sh shocking, inspiring vision for the future. Um, a huge amount of content and a huge amount of vision and hope. And I want to thank you. To the audience, I say thank you for joining us um, in this short hour discussion. Um, Kim Pullman, Paul, and uh, Reboot the Future and Ecosiv will be present at COP26. We'll be doing several live panels like this on various stages and places. 
and uh, encourage you to watch both websites and also the websites of these participants, some of whom may actually be at COP6 and on some of those at COP26 and then some of those. Watch for more information as we get closer to the time. And now it's my pleasure to hand back to our overall host, Grace Okafor. Well, Philip, you've kind of consolidated all of our thoughts. So thank you again to all the panelists for taking the time out of your day today to share your insights and your experiences. This has been extremely powerful in terms of what the audience can take away. So um, as mentioned, be sure to sign up for our mailing list on the Ecosiv and Reboot sites and stay tuned for the next panel discussion. We'll be having resources and a podcast and video series to be released in early 2022. So thank you all so very much. <laughs>